I like to say that there's crazy people and religious crazy people, and the religious crazy people are crazier than the crazy people because they think they have God on their sides. In the 16th century, a German theology professor nailed some not so nicely worded notes to the door of his local Catholic church, and so became catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther's intent was reform, but the effects produced a lasting cultural and at times violent divide between Catholics and Protestants. And in the past 500 years, the Catholic Church has not seen that sort of internal upheaval and division. That is, until now. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. I'm Ian Bremmer. This is the place where you can hear extended interviews with the world leaders, newsmakers, and experts that I feature on my public television show every week. Today on the podcast, things are about to get downright holy. Since that white smoke first billowed out of the Vatican in 2013 and the words Abemos Papem rang throughout the world, we have a Pope. Pope Francis has gone from rock star to lightning rod, just as a battle erupted inside the Catholic Church. And as the faithful choose sides in a culture war with big implications for everything from gay rights to climate change to immigration, I'll interview a priest who has courted controversy of his own and done so with hundreds of thousands of followers in his flock. I'm talking about Father James Martin, a Jesuit priest with a massive social media following, and he's taken plenty of heat from within the Catholic Church for his coming out in support of LGBT issues and migrant rights. And his outspokenness is all the more remarkable given his high-profile position within the church. In fact, just last month, he had his own private audience with Pope Francis. No doubt the two had plenty to discuss. And so did we. So let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Father James Martin. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. Father Jim Martin, very good to be with you. My pleasure. You're by far the most formally dressed person that I've had on this show. I just want to let you know. <laughs> no, really. Uh, uh, we haven't talked um, about the Catholic Church. We haven't talked about the Catholic Church in the the global order, and you're someone that's very outspoken on a lot of policy issues, so I've been looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Uh, Let me start stuff that you've been talking perhaps most about, um, particularly on LGBT issues, um, where you've written about it, uh, a book uh, called Building a Bridge, um, obviously an area where the Catholic Church has not been seen um, as the most progressive or outspoken to where we are in the 21st century. Um, how How do you fit? in this debate right now? Well, I'm trying to get the Catholic Church to treat LGBT people with uh, what the catechism calls respect, compassion, and sensitivity, and more basically, the gospel value of love and inclusion and welcome. So it's, it's pretty basic. It's not really challenging any church teaching. It's just asking the church to treat these people as, uh, as human beings and as beloved children of God, rather than as lepers, which is the way they're treated right now by many people in the church. The first thing to remind people, both the LGBT Catholics and people who are ministering to them, is that they're already Catholic. Okay, so they're baptized. And uh, a lot of them may not agree with some parts of church teaching, but there are plenty of people in the Catholic Church, um, uh, married couples who use birth control, people who don't agree with uh, the church's teaching on the death penalty or on the economy, uh, you know, who disagree with church teaching. So they are not the only ones that find themselves in this particular case um, disagreeing with church teaching. And that does not mean they need to exempt themselves from the church. Um, you would never say to a, a couple who doesn't believe in, who, who believes in birth control, you know, you're not Catholic, you should never come to the church. Unfortunately, LGBT Catholics are the only ones, you know, uh, you know, upon whom we focus this kind of moral microscope on their, their sexual lives. So um, I think, I think for something, something intrinsic to how they, you, you don't define yourself intrinsically, very few people would say, oh, I'm a birth control user. You know, that doesn't, you, you can say I'm a Scorpio. You're just really going to go down that path. A lot of people are going to say, I'm a gay man. I'm a gay woman. I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of, it's fun. It's foundational. It's identity. And if the church is saying that's a disorder, I, it, it does seem like it would create a, a bigger, a much bigger hurdle 
to make these people feel like they're actually thought of as God's children. Yeah, that's a very good point. And it does. And it is. And it is very difficult, which is the reason why we have to welcome LGBT people, because those words, I mean, intrinsically disordered or objectively disordered, are probably the biggest barrier today for LGBT Catholics to feel not only welcomed by the church, but loved by God. And so that's even more foundational. So trying to encourage them to see themselves as love. But you're absolutely right. You know, it is a huge barrier um, for a lot of people. And yet a lot of people, a lot of LGBT Catholics just set that aside, just as a couple who uses birth control says, you know, in my conscience, I've decided this is what we're going to do. And they feel comfortable in the church. So there's conscience um, in there as well. But you're right. It is a barrier for people. But leaving aside the Vatican official position is what I asked you before. You personally don't really believe that. Well, I'm not going to challenge any church teaching. No, no, I'm not asking you to challenge. I'm just saying, but that doesn't mean that you're, you know, in other words, you're not saying a gay parishioner is coming to you and saying, do you think I have a disorder? You're not saying, yeah, that's right, because the church tells it. Well, part of it is, is saying to people, look, there, there's, there's a couple of things. Number one, people have to understand the gospel. So this yes. is if people come to me and ask me that. Second of all, people have to understand church teaching. You know, you really do have to understand this church teaching. Third of all, which has been lost, you have to understand your conscience. And for a Catholic, conscience is the final moral arbiter of, of the decision, of the moral life. And so a lot of it's trusting the conscience of the individual, himself or herself, or, you know, in the case of a transgender person, themselves. Um, and it's, so it's not about me, you know, they, they already know church teaching. It's about me helping them sort of discern based on their conscience. So is, is some of this a little bit, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, uh, an ironic way to ask the question, but when I see Trump saying some things that many in the GOP tent find objectively ludicrous, but they know they can't say that because they're in the GOP, they're in the Senate, they're in the House. And so you just find a way to say, look, let's get to business as usual. We're all fighting for the same sorts of things. Do you sometimes feel that way in the Catholic Church? On, on which issue? On this particular on issue? this or on other issues. I mean, on a bunch where, I mean, the church doesn't move very much. And frequently, you know, you find it at odds with 21st century life. But you're a part of it. And you're part of it for reasons that are much deeper um, in terms of spirituality and humanity and belief in God than what the Pope happens to say today. Well, the, the point is that the fundamental teaching is Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus in the Gospels and, you know, Christ is risen. I mean, these are the fundamental teachings for me. And so, yeah, there. I mean, there are some things in the catechism that I may not agree with or may not understand even. You know, it's, it's hard to understand the whole catechism. But the foundation of the faith is about Jesus. And I think what happens, unfortunately, in, in our country is that we get so bogged down on those particular issues, you know, like intrinsic disorder or the economy, that Catholics feel that um, they're being marginalized, you know, when they should feel welcome because they believe in Christ. That's what I'm saying. I mean, which is not a... It's not a popular thing to say kind of in the secular media, but we're all about Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and that really supersedes and precedes any of these other discussions. So when someone comes to me and says, you know, I have a hard time with this part of the catechism, I say, well, let's talk about Jesus. I mean, that's one line in the catechism. And that does not sort of supersede or, or negate any of the person's relationship with Jesus. So the, the Pope seems a little bit also hard to pin down on this issue. And perhaps, again, not surprisingly on the one side, He's on a plane. He says, who am I to judge when asked about gays? On the other hand, um, he was helping block gay marriage in Slovakia, right, and adoption uh, rights for gay couples. Um, how Do you think this is a place where he, is he actively searching for a better solution? Is he trying to push the church on this issue? I would say he's trying to push the church to be more welcoming. Um, that's a very good question. Um, he has certainly been much more open um, than any of his predecessors. He's the first pope to ever use the word gay. As you said, his five most famous words are, who am I to judge? He has gay friends. Um, he has said to people, a friend of mine, you know, you were born that way. So he's really taken some dramatic steps. By the same token, he's also an 82-year-old Argentine, you know, former Jesuit provincial. And so he's going to come with certain ways of doing things. And he also, he's running the whole church. I mean, something that might seem really tepid to us, like, who am I to judge? In sub-Saharan Africa or in Latin America or in India, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Uh, and to say, you were born that way. So I think one of the things we tend to forget in the West is he's speaking to the entire world. Um, and 
while we may say, you know, not far enough or not fast enough, for other parts of the world, it's too far and it's too fast. Well, no question. First of all, within yeah. the United States, there are a lot of people that would say, whoa, 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 this is like well beyond what I believe. But when you talk about places like Uganda, right, where, oh, yeah. I mean, well, where you know, people are getting, getting murdered. killed. Yeah. I mean, literally, right. it's a, an execution offense. Yeah. And I think one of the sort of leading edges now for the Vatican is this question of the decriminalization of homosexuality. You know, where can the Vatican stand um, with LGBT people where it's not about, you know, same-sex relations or same-sex marriage, but it's just about living. And so I would say that that would be the, I, I think, I hope that's a, the next thing that the Vatican does. Because yeah. you, you, can, you can be opposed to same-sex marriage and same-sex, but the idea that people would be killed, executed, beaten up, I mean, that should be an easy thing for the church to, to stand against. And even some criminalization of same-sex relations, you'd say the Catholic Church should really be opposed to that. Yeah. I mean, because you can be against uh, same-sex marriage, right? But the idea that you would criminalize these things, you know, that people would go to jail for them makes no sense. I mean, why not criminalize divorce? I mean, there's something that Jesus was actually against in the Gospels, right? You're going to criminalize birth control? So, yeah, it's it, the, the Catholic Church, I think, has been so... Uh, unable to listen to these people, um, that it has no sense of p these people's um, real life problems. And one of them is, you know, in overseas is discrimination that would lead you to get killed. Another in the United States is, you know, beatings and suicides, those kinds of things. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to remind the church that for many people, these are life issues, right? I mean, in Uganda, for example, it's a life issue. It's a pro-life issue. Another life issue, since we're talking about big social issues right now, is immigration. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there are a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of Christians in the United States that are saying, no mas, too many. Um, hot button issue for the 2016 election will again be in 2020. How we deal with the border, um, how we deal with illegal immigration in the United States. Should the Catholic Church have a perspective, a policy perspective on immigration in the U.S.? Well, the Catholic Church already does. Um, the U.S. Bishops' Conference has been very strong in terms of defending the rights of migrants. and worldwide refugees. I worked for, for two years in East Africa with uh, refugees all over East Africa. And, you know, it, it comes down to Jesus's invitation to welcome the stranger, period. It's pretty clear. Um, you know, I always tell people, you know, you can be Christian, but this is what's in the Gospels. And it doesn't take a whole lot of interpretation. Jesus is very clear about welcoming the stranger, the alien, the foreigner, the migrant. So, you know, take it or leave it. So, I mean, Trump and Pope Francis have had some run-ins. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 2017, uh, Trump actually criticized Pope Francis as being a very political person. Mm. And the Pope actually came back and said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. What, what does that mean? What does it mean that Pope Francis is political and, and how, how should the papacy um, embrace politics? He's not political in the sense that he's Democrat or Republican or he believes in one political party in Europe. But the gospel, you know, preaching the gospel sometimes has political implications. And so if you preach about caring for the poor or caring for the sick or helping the refugee or the stranger, that's going to have political implications. There's going to be one party that supports that and one party doesn't. So I think his point is, if I am seen as political, so be it. But he does not set out to be political or partisan. He sets out to preach the gospel. And if that disturbs people on one side of the aisle, then so be it. He has gotten involved uh, directly in trying to help resolve some conflicts, mm -hmm. um, certainly directly in Cuba, mm -hmm. in Iran, indirectly uh, in Venezuela. Um, what's the record recently of the, uh, of the Catholic Church in inserting itself in these conflicts? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you say recently. Um, that's, I mean, I think someone said to me once, the Catholic Church has been dealing with leaders since Charlemagne's time, right? So it goes back a long time. I think over time, uh, well, selling indulgences a, is useful. Yeah, there's right? that I mean, too, right? Yeah. But I would say in general, he has seen, Francis is seen as a real moral voice. There was an article uh, recently in The Guardian of him being the, the last moral voice. I think he's seen as above uh, politics. So I think he's been pretty effective. I think it just, for example, when he visited the Holy Land and was able to reach out to both Israelis and Palestinians, you know, in a, a very sensitive way. I'm not a I'm not a politician, so I couldn't judge it. But I think he's been pretty effective. Do you feel, um, because of the, you know, extraordinary opulence of the Vatican itself, some of the banking scandals they've had recently, at a time when so many people are turning against anything that shows a concentration of wealth, 
Um, how much more scrutiny do you find yourself under? Do you find your colleagues under as a consequence in terms of um, trying to make sure that you're not alienating or disenfranchising people that think that you are other? Oh, that's interesting. You mean in terms of wealth or in yeah. terms of... Well, well, I take a, yeah. well, I take a vow of poverty, I know. so I own nothing. So that doesn't really... Um, I, mean, I, I think most people understand that, that I'm not in it for the money. I, all of my royalties for my books goes to the Jesuits, and so I have no money. Uh, but you mean more in terms yeah. of the church I'm talking about power. church, of course. Yeah, I think the sex abuse scandals have made it more difficult than anything else. I think it's less a sense of people's suspicion of religion in general, more suspicion of the Catholic Church and priests. And so I think that would be more difficult for me and more difficult for my colleagues. Um, has been an environment where so many people that are really believed in as leaders are having a harder time showing that they have the characters that merit that authority. And the Pope was seen as a rock star when he ascended, and less so now, and in significant part because of the reaction and the revulsion to so many of these sex scandals. How, what, what's the impact it's having on the church? Oh, it's devastating. Um, it, it's hard to quantify. Certainly, you have kind of concentric circles of people who are affected. So you have victims, obviously, affected the most, and then family members, and then parishioners in parishes where priests have been removed, and then uh, parishioners in dioceses where uh, bishops have, uh, you know, shuff shuffled people around or themselves have been removed. Uh, it, it's, it's very personal for people. Um, it's a huge... Um, let down for people. Uh, it's it's sin. And so, you know, I always tell people the the effects of real serious sin are just, uh, they sort of radiate out. So it's not just the victim. It's in a sense, it's the whole church. And then, you know, secondarily, you have um, people who are affected by uh, the, the, the loss of money from the diocese. So the diocese pay out money, which means that they have to, which they should, but that also means that they have less money for services. And so the poor and schools and hospitals. So it really does show you the, the, destruction, the destructive value of, um, of sin, I think. Why did it happen? I mean, why was it so widespread and why was it covered up for so long? The main reason is um, that we had these guys uh, in the priesthood, right, or in religious life and religious orders uh, who were sick, right, and who, who committed pedophilia who should have never been accepted. That's one of the main reasons. And then once discovered, they should have never been allowed to, um, you know, continue in the priesthood. Okay. So you have that. I think most people... But it's not a few. I mean, it's an extraordinarily widespread problem. It is, but by the same... I don't want to excuse it. It's roughly the same percentage as in the general population. Nonetheless, even one would be too many. So most people can understand that. Or you have these people who are... They're pedophiles and they have the sickness... I think the, the second reason is stuff, stuff that people do, do not excuse, which is bishops who didn't understand how to confront these guys who were mendacious, who covered up. Okay. Uh, you have a system of clericalism, which I think you could describe as someone taking the uh, word of the priest more than the, the victim or the parent, right? You have this uh, system that says that we shouldn't, quote unquote, scandalize people by you know, bringing these things out into the open. Um, you have bishops who were afraid because of... Because it'll hurt the church more broadly. Right, and it, it would scandalize the faithful. Um, you have uh, bishops who themselves, um, you know, don't know how to deal with uh, pedophilia and these crimes. They're, they're, not, they're not equipped to deal with it. They don't know what to do legally. They don't know what to do psychologically. Even if they do know what to do, which is to remove these people, they have a hard time confronting them. So it's this kind of, it's very systemic. Um, but at heart, um, it's an institution that was unable to... Um, address these men and remove them, you know, immediately. And once they had done something like that, to also to turn them over to the to civil authorities, you know, who in many cases would kind of turn a blind eye, you know, well, Father's okay. And you also have, this is not blaming them, but back in the 70s and 80s, you had uh, psychologists and psychiatrists saying that this was a curable thing. So pedophilia was seen as more curable. And so you could be treated and then placed back in the ministry. Well, we know that that's not true anymore. So it's this, it's this kind of horrible mixture of, of all this sin that's going on. Um, it really defies description, though. There's not, there's not one explanation for it. So do you think, I mean, the, are you worried about the Catholic Church losing ground to evangelicalism? I mean, I was in Brazil recently, and you see you go north, and, 
I mean, the only big, the biggest buildings in towns, football stadium, evangelical stadium, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're talking about, right? And I mean, as the church continues to expand, you see massive growth there. You see massive growth in the United States. Um, how, why is it happening? Um, what's the Catholic Church doing about it, if anything? I think in Latin America, it's less about the sex abuse crisis, although that may be more uh, true now in the last couple of years, and more about um, a church that I think got uh, complacent and arrogant and assumed that, well, you know, we're the church and you're, we're in Brazil or in Venezuela or in wherever, and of course you're all Catholic and so you're going to come to the church. So therefore, it did very little in terms of outreach and welcome. And I think what people are finding in the evangelical churches is a sense of personal welcome. So I think that the Catholic Church has to learn from that. Um, yeah, and I am worried because it says that we're not doing something right down there. Now, I mean, there's still, you know, millions and millions of Catholics in Latin America, but you're right, they've made inroads. I mean, I don't like to see it as like a battle, but I think it's important to see what the Catholic Church could learn from these groups. And I think a lot of it, it's about welcome and, and sort of personal outreach. Everyone's a little crazy these days, right? <laughs> Politics except, except are crazy, me. religious, we're all a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Some people are more crazy than that. You, you've said that, some of the craziest people out there are religious people. Yeah, I like to say that there's crazy people and religious crazy people, and the religious crazy people are crazier than the crazy people because they think they have God on their sides. That's, that's the problem. So it's not just crazy, it's I'm crazy and God is on my side, and I'm a prophet, and I'm gonna tell you what to do because God told me. And if you don't believe in my way, you're going to hell. Yeah, pretty much. Which I was told, by the way, when I was in school. Hmm. I hope that's not true anymore. Uh, it is, we definitely do not tell people they're going to hell. If they don't yeah. accept the one true Jesus. We definitely don't tell people that. That's yeah. really good. So can people be too Catholic? Well, what do you mean by too Catholic? Like, a little crazy about Catholic. Like other Catholic people that aren't Catholic, it's everything's about, you've got to be a part of, you have to believe everything I believe. Yeah, I think there's, um, there are Catholics, I like to say, that are so Catholic they barely seem Christian anymore, uh, that are just all about judging other people and uh, coming out against other people, especially in social media, you see this. Uh, you know, you're a heretic, you're an apostate, you're a false Catholic. And you get a fair amount of this. Oh, I get a lot of that. Yeah. I think I get most of it. Um, yeah, and it's, it's people going against the Gospels where Jesus says, judge not. I mean, that's pretty clear too. We're, we're not the judges, God is the judge. So yeah, I think people can mistake Catholicism for basically a religion of a rule book and black and white and ticking off boxes. It's about an encounter with the person, Jesus. It's about an encounter with a uh, mystery, who is Jesus. It's not about whether or not you tick off these boxes. It's not like taking a driving test. Unfortunately, um, and I don't know where it came from, but a lot of Catholics, especially in this country, uh, and these are the ones that oppose Francis, see it as uh, rules. And you know, I, it's ironic because you read the gospels and, and Jesus comes into contact with some of the scribes and Pharisees, and this is exactly what he rejects, this kind of obsession with uh, legalism. So what's an issue that matters to you that you're having, a real issue, that you're having a challenge in terms of your conscience telling you what would be the right way to handle it? Wow, um, you want me to narrow it down? Or? Yeah, sure, <laughs> give me one, what comes to mind? Mm, I think the question for me would be, this may sound a little banal, but the question for me is, how political should I be in, in a world where I am supposed to be apolitical? So for example, where is it right to actually critique you know, a president by name. Uh, where is it right to say that this is, uh, this is evil, right? Versus in general talk about refugees, right? When does a person have to stand up and say, this individual is evil or this individual is being led by the evil spirit? Um, where is one colluding by not saying that? You know, I mean, I often think of, you know, look at the great people. I mean, that, you could say it about Kim Jong-un, I, I doubt you'd have much of a problem calling him but out. But see, I wouldn't behaviors. say that. You I wouldn't, wouldn't, no, I wouldn't say this, this person, I try to avoid the ad hominem. I might say that this policy is- This system? Th this system or this decision that he made. You know, I always think of the Hitler analogy. At what point does the priest have to speak out against the individual? And maybe, uh, maybe the answer is never, you know? Um, but in the case, I mean, I admire so many, so many of the Catholic priests, and there are a lot, uh, Rupert Meyer and a lot of the Catholic resistance. Um, look at someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? and they spoke out against Hitler. That's a real moral question for me. And, I, and I'm being inarticulate because I'm not sure where I stand on that. Mm -hmm. So you have not come out individually against the present administration? No, and I don't think, it, no, I haven't. And I think it's really important. I think one of the reasons 
What is it that you're struggling with? You're saying, I'm not sure how I feel about X. Um, when, is, when would it be the right time to do that, if ever? So, for example, I admire Dietrich Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. one of my heroes, and Rupert Myers, a Jesuit, um, for specifically, you know, sort of naming things. I don't know if I'm in that situation. I don't know if I'll ever be in that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's kind of a moral question. You know, actually, it's a big one. It's not banal. That's one that you, it, it, it's that you big, struggle. but it's also it's actually not something that comes up every day because it's easy to speak out against um, particular issues. I mean, I can be an advocate for LGBT people sure. and for migrants and refugees without batting an eye. And the other reason, let me let me argue on the other side now. It's it's actually important not to do that because you end up splitting the church. So, for example, if I were a priest in the pulpit and I'm, I get up and I say you should all vote Republican or you should all vote Democrat, that's terrible. It makes the church political. Um, frankly, we're not supposed to be doing that anyway because of our tax exempt status, but it also splits your congregation. So that's why I try to avoid it. But I, I sometimes look at these people that I admire and they were pretty blunt, you know? So I think about that. Father Jim Martin, great to be with you. My pleasure, thank you. That's our show this week. We'll be right back here next week, same place, same time, unless you're watching on social media, in which case it's wherever you happen to be, don't miss it. In the meantime, check us out at g0media.com. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.